Good evening. Welcome to North Beat. I'm Megan Roberts. RCMP and Yellowknife are over-policing unhoused Indigenous women in the Northwest Territories. That's what a new report from the Yellowknife Women's Society says. And as Sarah Kromolowski reports, it calls for big changes in the territory. The report, released this morning, is called Over-Policed and Underprotected, and it's partly based on discussions with Indigenous women who've lived on Yellowknife streets. Nisha Rao is one of the report's authors, and she says the women express strongly that they don't feel safe going to RCMP for help. So there were experiences of violence, of being arrested, of being mistreated, of being discriminated against, of being made to feel as less than. The report also includes recommendations about how to fix those relationships, both big and small. Among them, the authors ask for better oversight of RCMP in the Northwest Territories, they ask for Indigenous police liaison roles here in Yellowknife, and they ask for workshops where women can learn about what their rights are when dealing with the police. But one of the biggest recommendations is for better social programs in Yellowknife, so Indigenous women don't end up on the streets in the first place. CBC asked the Northwest Territories RCMP if they would follow the recommendations. A spokesperson said that they're still reviewing the report and could not provide an interview at this time. Sarah Kromolowski, CBC News, Yellowknife. The ongoing work of creating a new Missing Persons Act for the NWT moved to the Mackenzie Delta this week. MLAs are looking to hear from people about the proposed act. It's a bill that's of great interest in the region. That's where Frank Grubin is from. He's the Inuvialuit Gwich'in man who went missing from Fort Smith 11 months ago. Deslerine reports. The NWT Missing Persons Act was first proposed in 2020, but since 30-year-old Frank Grubin disappeared in May 2023, the pressure has been on to finally get it done. If passed, this new act would give RCMP more powers to access things like cell phone records and financial and health information when someone goes missing things that could help in a search. Over a dozen people were at the consultation in Inuvik last night. I told them, if that was your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your babysitter for crying out loud. They told MLAs they need better communication from the RCMP when someone goes missing. And they also said they need access to resources so they can do things like make posters to put up around town. For MLAs, some said hearing the story straight from constituents was important and moving. It's been very emotional, uh, especially in Eklavik where we were yesterday. Um, you know, that, that, that uh, Frank Rubin Jr. case has been uh, top of mind for the community. It's our, our colleague, uh, Mr. Nersu, has, has brought that on the floor of the ledge and we're very pleased to be there to hear directly. But this is an important bill. This is like, this is literally life or death and uh, I'm glad we're, we're moving forward on it. Where they stand on this legislation. With the chair of the committee wants to see this bill passed. This bill is very important, important for the NWT, for, our, for everybody, because uh, it's giving the tools for the RCMP to work with and to work with the families, to work with the people. The committee will include the feedback it's heard this week in its recommendations about the act. MLAs will vote on the bill next month. Des Lorene, CBC News, Inuvik. Hay River is getting a new power distribution company. The Northwest Territories Public Utilities Board approved the transfer from Northland Utilities to the NWT Power Corporation last month. Carla Ulrich has been looking into the story and she joins us now to break it all down. So Carla, what can you tell us about this recent decision? Well, the town decided to switch in 2016 when the NWT Power Corp promised lower rates. But since then, the case has been caught up in litigation after Northland's utilities objected to the transfer, citing that it was not in the best interest of the public and that the power rates would significantly increase for the remaining customers and other communities powered by Northland utilities. But on March 26th, the Public Utilities Board found that the sale was in the best interest of the public and that there would be no harm to any group of customers of either utility as a result of the transaction. And what does Northland say about all of this? Uh, not much right now. In an emailed statement, Northland Utilities said they are currently reviewing the decision but have no comment at this time. Uh, they said they remain committed to collaborating with all stakeholders and 
uh, to find sustainable energy solutions for the NWT. And what does the town have to say about this change, Carla? Well, the senior administrative officer, Glenn Smith, said that the town is pleased that the pub has ruled that the purchase is in the best interest of the public and that the town continues to expect electricity related cost savings for residents and businesses that reduce the cost of living and increase the strength of the local economy. So do we know when the sale will happen? Uh, the Public Utilities Board gave the closing date of December 31st, 2024. Uh, for the assets purchase and sale transaction with the possibility of extra time to avoid higher rates that could occur from the transaction. Um, Northland and NTPC have also been directed to file general rate applications before the transaction date. Okay, thanks for all your work on this, Carla. Thank you, Megan. A new international agreement on Chinook salmon took center stage at the Yukon River panel discussions in Anchorage, Alaska. The seven-year agreement aspires to get at least 71,000 Chinook to the international border. Now, if Chinook numbers are higher, there could be a limited catch for ceremonial purposes. But as Julian Geniak reports, Indigenous representatives are raising questions about how the moratorium could affect cultural harvests. One Alaska Native panel member doubts the agreement will uphold Indigenous rights to fish. For years, Rhonda Pitka says her community of Beaver, Alaska has held potlatch without salmon. And that's despite subsistence fishing having some protections. I say I don't trust that this agreement will protect those ceremonial uses to the degree that's necessary. Pauline Frost is a panel member and the chief of the Vuntetkwichin government. She says every self-government agreement institutes fish and wildlife protection. Frost says recovering Chinook will take collective action along the whole length of the river. If that happens, she says everyone will benefit, hopefully with salmon. We have to be consistent in how we manage these resources from here on. Every fish counts. The U.S. panel chair says there simply aren't enough fish to meet all traditional needs. John Linderman says instead the goal really is to try to maintain cultural connections while rebuilding the salmon stock. Julian Giniak, CBC News, Whitehorse. Two Iqaluit churches are asking city council to reverse a 2022 bylaw. The bylaw requires religious and non-profit organizations to pay property taxes on their main buildings. The CBC's TJ Deer reports. Iqaluit's Roman Catholic Church recently presented to City Council about why they're not happy with being asked to pay $38,000 of property taxes. The City of Iqaluit passed a bylaw two years ago requiring religious and non-profit organizations to pay property taxes on non-residential buildings, but they can still apply for an exemption from the city. Now, another church is speaking out about the same issue. Despite receiving a 75% exemption for the next four years, St. Jude's Anglican Cathedral are being asked to pay $29,000 per year. Chris Dow is the church's rector. He says this has made their financial situation worse. We have increasing costs in any number of areas, including in insurance. So our insurance bill for everything is $100,000. Um, additional $29,000 in property taxes. We have increasing utility costs, as we all do, as all people do in the north here. To get the city to repeal the bylaw, the Roman Catholic Church started a petition hoping that other religious and nonprofit groups will sign. St. Jude's received the petition, but will leave it to church leaders to decide what to do next. David Amborski is an urban planning professor at Toronto Metropolitan University. He says he's surprised that Iqaluit passed the bylaw. With the uh... Church is being reliant on mostly donations. Um, it's very difficult to if, especially face new budgetary increases like that. It probably represents a significant portion of their annual budget, I would suspect. The city of Iqaluit declined an interview request. A city spokesperson said there's nothing new outside what's already public and that city council will be discussing the issue soon. TJ Deer, CBC News, Iqaluit. The Giant Mine Remediation Project is below its employment targets for Northern and Indigenous hires. In a recent update to Yellowknife City Council, the remediation team revealed its employment performance for 2022-23. Indigenous employment is supposed to be between 25 to 35 percent, but only 18 percent were employed for the project. 
Northern employment is supposed to be between 55 to 75 percent, but Northerners only filled 36 percent of the positions set those targets, we did consider them to be aspirational. We knew they were going to be hard to meet. Um, so we certainly have our social advisory body and our working group that look at ways we can meet our targets. Um, the community benefits agreements with our Indigenous partners as well to provide training and funding to them to look at what training we can do to target it is a, certainly a big piece uh, to get to the, um, to the Indigenous employment. Plato says they're always open to feedback on how to improve. The only employment goal on track for the Giant Mine Remediation Project is female employment. The federal government has unveiled its plan to make home ownership affordable for more Canadians. The move comes ahead of next week's budget, and it's the latest in a string of announcements by the Liberals apparently targeting young Canadians. The CBC's Ashley Burke reports. Another pre-budget announcement aimed at Millennials and Gen Z. Many younger Canadians feel that the dream of home ownership is just that, a dream. Our government is changing that. Millennials helped catapult the Liberals into power in 2015. Now eight years later, the party's trying to win back their support as they struggle in the polls common sense of the common and have been hammered for months by the Conservatives. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled. We want home ownership to be a reality for younger Canadians. The government announcing that starting next week, first-time home buyers can pull out up to $60,000 from their RRSP for a down payment on a home. That's $25,000 more than before. And they won't have to start repaying those contributions for five years. For those who don't have a 20% down payment, they will have more time to pay off their mortgages. Effective August 1st of this year, we are allowing 30-year amortizations on insured mortgages for first-time home buyers purchasing newly built homes. That includes new condos and townhouses. The government says it will make monthly mortgage payments more affordable. Developers and builders say it will also spur new construction, which has been slow because people can't afford to buy. We can get more first-time buyers into the market. That enables us to build more homes. It also frees up rental units, too. Canada needs 1.3 million new homes by 2030 to get rid of the country's housing gap. That's according to a new report today by the Parliamentary Budget Officer. It will not be a game changer for everybody, but for some it will be another piece of the incremental support they're looking for. This all comes ahead of the budget on Tuesday. The finance minister says that the deficit won't grow, so the question now is how will the government come up with the revenue to pay for its new promises? Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Treaty in Cree is Naskumitoan, an oral agreement. And our agreements were always spoken. For George Spence, the core of treaty was we chihioin, to help one another. And so we, the commissioners... He was there for the making of Treaty 9, where the Cree were told... We will honor this agreement together for as long as the sun shines and the waters flow. The Cree made their mark because they were assured that the land would be shared and they would always be able to harvest what they needed. George Spence was my great-grandfather. In his life, he saw many promises of the treaty go unfulfilled. Treaties were essential to the creation of Canada. First Nations still fight for the agreements to be honored. Priya doesn't love exercising, but loves the way it makes her feel. Max doesn't love cooking, but loves homemade meals with his kids. Paul 
doesn't love doing his taxes, but loves getting the benefits and credits he qualified for. Learn more about benefits and credits like the GST, HST credit and Canada Workers Benefit at Canada.ca slash every dollar counts. A message from the Government of Canada. I will not forgive failure. God has chosen us as a new broom to sweep the Vatican clean of corruption. What would you like to do with your life? I'd like to be an international star. Are you a hug? You're crying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Well, God will take his revenge then. Yes, he will. With our help. What does it take to reach the top? Join me, Ian Hanamansing, as I get to know some truly inspirational people <laughs> who share the secrets of their success. If you want to talk about one moment? It's a moment where I would live or die. It changed everything on CBC News Explore. Moments that are so on trend right now. Ticket prices, artificial intelligence, being a Swift, wild fashion trends, showbiz and cancel culture. Join me, Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, for Commotion. Available now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcast. Sipping on a bit of Henny. Can I get a little Remy? Feeling heavy. Chilling, but I'm feeling ready. Pulled up in a big old Chevy. Alberta wildfire is planning for increased fire danger in some parts of the province because of the lack of moisture. As Travis McEwen reports, there are some early signs of what may come, including fire restrictions and bans. This is a fairly fresh grass fire near Anthony Henday Drive and Highway 16. Now brush and grass fires like this can signify dry conditions and what's expected to be a very busy wildfire season. On Tuesday, RCMP and emergency crews responded to a large grass fire on the Enoch Cree Nation. Some residents had to evacuate their homes as a precaution, but it was extinguished and they were allowed back within a few hours. In Edmonton, fire crews have been dealing with similar fires. There was nine on Tuesday and another five small fires on Wednesday. The crisp blackened grass of a picturesque lookout in Beverly Heights shows the aftermath of one of them. As a precaution, counties throughout the province are announcing fire bans, or at least advisories. Alberta Wildfire reported close to 10 active wildfires this year as of Thursday, and 42 carried over from last year. Close to 500 firefighters and staff have been trained in preparation. 1,100 of them, along with support staff, are expected to be fully ready to go by mid-May. We're also going to enter kind of a critical time for wildfires in Alberta because we're seeing a lot of exposed dry vegetation um, and green up hasn't happened yet. So this is kind of a critical time when um, fires can ignite very easily and spread quickly. This all comes after a record breaking year for wildfires in 2023. The number of them has been about average, but the burning was way more severe, which covered 10 times more area than the five year average. In the short term, Environment Canada is calling for rain and snow throughout northern Alberta this week, but it may need to be a lot to really hold off another hectic wildfire season. Travis McEwen, CBC News, Edmonton. One factor that can reduce wildfires in the summer is the formation of a thick snowpack in the winter. Across much of British Columbia, though, this year, that didn't happen. Michelle Morton has that story. As of April 1st, the provincial snowpack is at 63% of normal, 25% lower than last year and the lowest since records began in 1970. Without that snowpack, we're going to be dependent on periodic rain throughout the summer to both saturate the ground and to keep our forests um, both vitalized and to keep snow or to keep the fire danger low, but also to maintain this flow in the, the streams and the rivers. The report finds only Vancouver Island saw a normal amount of precipitation. Daniels warns the El Nino winter kicked off in early spring, setting us up for a long dry wildfire season. And we know that we're in a multi-year drought. So these are places already that had low precipitation last summer. We had big fires as a result last summer. And um, we went right through the fall with low rainfall, not enough snow through the winter. 
The report comes just as Metro Vancouver announces its seasonal watering restrictions. Starting May 1st, residents and businesses can only water lawns once a week. The River Forecast Centre says the snowpack could increase into May with more cold, wet weather, and it notes the low snowpack could have one benefit. The lower risk for flooding this year in the interior, uh, areas that have been hard hit by flooding, I'm thinking about Cash Creek or Grand Forks, uh, they can, I hopefully will breathe a sigh of relief that the likelihood of flood this year is pretty low. But he warns sudden or extreme rain could still cause flooding. Michelle Morton, CBC News, Vancouver. A beloved fox in the Yukon has been euthanized. Known as Buddy to many, his story is an incredible one. He was thought to be an abandoned puppy when he was first found way back in 2014. Some even thought the little guy was an otter. In the end, it was clear he was a fox and he was also famous. The fox ended up living at the Yukon Wildlife Preserve, and after a decade there, staff made the difficult decision to put him to rest. Here's Lindsay Kaskinat sharing some of her memories of taking in the fox and his rise to fame. It was less than two weeks old when it came into our care. So when it opened its eyes, it was to humans, and it was to animal care staff at the Wildlife Preserve, not to its own kind. So in the, in the kind of months from when he joined our care at the Wildlife Center, you know, those beginnings are still an endeavor to, you know, provide the animal with the best possible life of, and survival. And at that young, you're just ma meeting basic needs. And still we're trying, though, at that point to ensure that staff are not spending too much time with it, only meeting its basic needs. But... One of the basic needs of a small animal is, is nurture, and, and it was a difficult balance. And ideally, you know, you're, you're thinking about, okay, this animal goes back into the wild. But in such an instance where that animal is opening its eyes to a different species, humans, it instantaneously makes that scenario a lot more challenging for a re-release that is successful or successful enough for the animal to have a fighting chance. And so... The first little while was, as any offspring raising, was pretty challenging. And then you add in that this adorable, fluffy, very charismatic little creature, and it's really hard not to get attached. And staff, yeah, had to battle with that. And then when there was, you know, greater understanding of this animal's long-term care and likeliness of not going back into the wild, you know, that starts to, to shift after realizing that no other facility was able or interested in taking this animal and giving it a long-term home. That also then spurred a lot of staff desire and all of the people who had joined in his story and were already a part of it, given the people who had picked him up and a bit a part of that surrogate work. And somehow it, his story just kind of caught all the media, like their People Magazine caught it somehow. As everyone created their own relationship and felt a sense of connection to this animal, it really became more and more clear that the reach of it was crazy. And so this needed to continue to evolve to be a part of those people's stories. And again, while that person who picked up the animal did not truly mean any negative harm to this wild animal, we live in a wilderness city in a landscape and a lot of us felt, a lot of the staff felt strongly that he, he had a greater story to tell through the rest of his life. And so the fundraising really became a part of like that human wildlife conflict. Even when we don't actively intend to do something, our actions often have impacts on animals. Keskinet says the fox often acted more like a dog. He loved it when people visited him. She says he lived a full life at the Yukon Wildlife Preserve.
And that is Northbeat for tonight. For news anytime, you can always go to our website, cbc.ca slash north. We leave you with some skidoring from the Tunic Time Festival. Thank you for watching. I'm Megan Roberts. Have a good night. What happens when we transform the country into one massive obstacle course? 20 total strangers are about to find out. Okay, game on! Relationships will be forged and crushed. I want to rip their heads off. In an all-out battle for glory. Oh my god! I'm glad that there's cameras around. Yeah, me too. Do it in, replay! Only <laughs> one thing's for sure. <laughs> they are not ready for what's coming. Good. Please be careful. I'm excited, dude. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> We're back with Crime Scene Kitchen. That's a bold choice. Yes, honey. <laughs> it's a very straightforward recipe. This is going to be an absolute showstopper. That's what I'm talking about right there. Woo! Yeah. I murdered a donut. That's a crime scene. <laughs> I'm such a fan of this show. Listen to the podcast, Q with Tom Power. The story itself is so unbelievable. The industry wasn't set up for me to thrive in. The presence I feel now is not something that I believe to be possible in the past. So many people thought I couldn't do it. They doubted me. I felt like I like ripped my whole heart out. I didn't realize how formative 25 to 30 would be. I have to kind of repress my own self-doubt. You're one of my favorite interviewers, so I was pumped. Get out of here. Q with Tom Power. Available now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. Her particular skill set can be helpful to us. She's a con artist. I need to get off that boat and back to being a full-time detective. And you need to stay out of prison. The best way we do that is to keep our heads down and do as we're told. Sipping on a bit of Henny. Can I get a little Remy? Feeling heavy. Chilling, but I'm feeling ready. Pulled up in a big old Chevy. Dance for all stops and Miguel them drops. Queen with the locks and the crown on top. Feed in a box, never sound on pop. If it ain't the Annie, give me crown on rocks. What do we know about that with Andrew Chang? I think we can explain. Watch free on CBC Gem.